My name is Kenneth Novitz. I'm a master's student in philosophy at the University of Edinburgh. And it's my pleasure to bring to you this interview with Clark McAllister, a PhD student in sociology at the Open University and an associate of the Notes from Below Collective. Clark's research focuses on the methodology of workers' inquiry and takes substantial inspiration from the labor struggles originating in 1950s Italy. Recently, Clark has published a book titled Karl Marx's Workers' Inquiry, International History, Reception and Responses. While Marx's original workers' inquiry is often reported on as a disappointing failure, this book explores Marx's methodology through what were in fact its impressive historical successes, not only in Marx's time, but also in reproductions of his original survey across Europe. It also reproduces versions of the workers' inquiry and responses to it from workers explaining their own understandings of the world and its problems. Clark, thank you so much for agreeing to speak with us today. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you so much. For starters, would you please talk us through your current research and what it was that brought you to workers' inquiry in the first place? Sure. So yeah, thanks again so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be able to talk about this. I really appreciate the interest. Yeah, currently my research focuses on looking at workers' inquiry uh, as a political practice and examining the history of this political practice uh, throughout the 20th to the 21st centuries uh, and a bit earlier as well. I'll look at the different ways in which different organizations, different groups have used workers' inquiry in order to aid their organizing efforts with workers. Um, and I also use workers' inquiry when researching contemporary forms of work and in different industries in Europe today. And hopefully I'll be able to talk further about that and in more detail at another time. Um, and yeah, in terms of what brought me to workers' inquiry, as a personal inclination on one level, I've always been fascinated with thinking about the sort of greater social forces at play in the workplace, uh, thinking critically about work on some level that I think is really difficult and not to do a worker's inquiry at work, to be thinking critically about different dynamics, management techniques, uh, ways of controlling workers. I think that's something probably we all do at work, whether it be thinking about ways in which we can get an extra, some extra time or lunch break, whether we could finish early or even in a really selfish and individualist way of thinking about ways to skive off, knowing when managers are going to be here or there and just winning back a bit of free time at work and things like this. And then also, whenever particular injustices occurred at different jobs that I've had, talking with co-workers about why these happen uh, and thinking about ways that we can resist particularly, particular tactics that we don't enjoy at work, particular things we have to do, and thinking about how we can actually make the work that we do work better for us. And um, sometimes even thinking about doing things more rationally than we're told to and things like that. So I think Workers Inquiry Hub has all these different elements to it. But on a more sustained level, politically, I really came to appreciate Workers Inquiry through two main groups who are based in the UK, and Notes from Below and Angry Workers. Uh, and both of these groups pursue Workers Inquiry as a means to organize workers in the class struggle today. Uh, and the more sustained forms of pursuing a workers' inquiry, which I'm sure we can talk about the ins and outs of this in a little bit, it's something that these groups have really pioneered. Uh, I'm also influenced by a particular French thinker, Alain Badiou, uh, and his emphasis on going out into the world and exploring and experiencing things firsthand for yourself rather than relying on what other people have said or written about a particular subject, actually experiencing uh, firsthand the dynamics of work and basing your politics and your critique on that. So yeah, on the one hand, a sort of personal inclination brought me to workers' inquiry. And then on the other hand, a political engagement with these contemporary Marxist groups and individuals. I suppose as well, the last thing I want to say about this is in Capital, Marx talks about the factory, the workplace in general, as a hidden abode with this sign, private property, no entry except on official business. And Marx is teasing us with this, of course, to, to enter this forbidden realm as political militants. And that's something that angry workers talk about a lot, looking at particular industries, particular workplaces, and 
the necessity of needing a job, but also thinking in spite of the drudgery of labor, I, I want to see this particular place, this factory, this warehouse. I want to see what this is like and what the dynamics of the production process are like inside. There's all these sort of elements that, that brought me to work as a choir. Perfect. You, you mentioned Angry Workers. They're an organization in the UK for which I have so much respect. They have this fantastic book that came out, what was it, two years ago, called Class Power on Zero Hours. And something they emphasize in it that I think is so impressive about workers in inquiry as this kind of methodology is that it's not some sort of arcane practice that academics are meant to be wielding to try and support the working class. At its most basic, it's just conversations you have at your, at your workplace with your comrades, with your coworkers to try and understand what's going on. And along those lines, then, I was wondering if you could just tell us in, in a nutshell, what exactly is Workers Inquiry, at least as you understand it? And maybe you could tell us a little bit about its history. Yeah, sure. I totally agree. A Workers Inquiry should not have so strict a definition that it can only be this particular way of investigating the workplace or thinking about the workplace. Workers Inquiries can take many different forms. And as you say, angry workers simply by it. By talking with co-workers and thinking critically about the labor process in and of itself, this contains the kernel of a worker's inquiry. But yet to provide a sort of rudimentary definition, which I suppose would help us here. Yeah, of course, I could talk a bit about what a worker's inquiry is roughly and its history as well. So there are many different practices that we could designate as inquiries. Marx relied extensively in his work on the inquiries pursued by the British state factory inspectors who were commissioned by the government to go out and investigate social conditions and working conditions in different workplaces in Britain. This had a massive impact on Marx and his own political development. But what really distinguishes a worker's inquiry from these other forms of research, although they may be inquiries, is that a worker's inquiry distinctly acts as a political intervention on the side of the working class. The term itself, Although there are many different practices we could call inquiry, the term itself really comes from a particular questionnaire, which Marx composed in 1880. Uh, he called this the Enquête Ouvrière, the Workers' Inquiry. Uh, and it took the form of a long survey with 101 uh, very detailed, very precise questions, which inquired into almost all aspects of the production process uh, from workers' own perspectives. And in a really in important introduction that Marx included to this workers' inquiry and to some other surveys that he also pioneered before this, he states that these efforts are to be instituted by the working class themselves and that only the working class and not saviors sent by providence can energetically apply the healing remedies to the social ills from which we suffer. So Marx is very clear on this. Only workers can secure their own emancipation uh, and the, a worker's inquiry is a small means, uh, but important starting point through which workers and other socialists, whether they be workers themselves or whether they be standing outside the workplace, can orient their politics towards affirming the leverage that workers have inside and outside the workplace. And since this original effort, the history of workers' inquiry has been monumental. You mentioned, I think, at the beginning about worker struggles in Italy and how this has been an important backdrop for workers' inquiry. Indeed, there were many different groups in Italy that, that pioneered workers' inquiry, largely based on Marx's original questionnaire, but also adapting variations of this method, approaching workers and organizing efforts. All over the world, workers' inquiry has been used, and very often, in fact, most often, we see different groups referencing, if not Marx's original survey, as an influence, and then at least Marx's program as an important preset for pursuing inquiry. And within Marx's own lifetime, this questionnaire had a significant impact. And through looking at this impact, we can actually see how a simple questionnaire can actually facilitate something like workers' self-emancipation. So in Poland, it appeared translated uh, within a few months uh, of Marx's original publication of the survey in France. Uh, and that's something I talk about uh, extensively in the book. Uh, and workers' inquiry, based on Marx's original survey, formed a significant method for early organizing efforts of the workers' movement in Poland. And it even had some influence in Russia as well in the subsequent decades. In the Netherlands, it was translated again in 1880. And it was even adapted slightly with some alterations to the questions 
to make Marx's survey more suitable for examining social conditions in the Netherlands at that time. And workers responded to this. Workers had a lot to say to Marx's questions. Workers' responses to the survey, again, which have been translated into English for the first time, a selection of these in the book. Workers talk about their frustrations at work, uh, about the dynamics of work, about uh, industrial accidents and health and safety. Um, and they also talk and reflect about their own experiences of trying to organize, of going on strike and of reflecting on the failures of some strikes uh, with one worker, for example, concluding that this was because of a lack of unity amongst the working class as a whole. So we can see that already within just a few months of Marx publishing this, that workers were engaging with this survey in very dynamic ways, adapting it, updating it and responding to it. And through those responses, we can understand the political composition of workers and also see the sort of emergent class consciousness that a worker's inquiry is able to, if not stimulate, then reveal which workers already have. So that's just a little bit about the history. I don't want to ramble on too much in case. No, I'm please. Like, it's all fascinating it. stuff. I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about the different workers' inquiries that you've compiled in this book. Just looking through the contents list, for example, you have people from Vladimir Lenin's workers' inquiry composed in 1894-95, also uh, Hilda Weiss, an associate of Eric Fromm, their workers' inquiry was later used for substantial projects associated with the Frankfurt School, like the authoritarian personality. And then it also seems like workers' inquiry didn't only have a presence in Europe, it also made its way all the way over to Sri Lanka. So I wanted to ask you, why is it that, at least in your opinion, all these groups from Marxist academics to famous revolutionaries have opted to use like workers inquiry as a specific methodology for their practice, what are its benefits and possible limitations? Sure. Yeah. As you say that there's been a massive distribution of Marxist survey and you mentioned the, the Sri Lankan context as well, the, a mass Trotskyist party published the workers inquiry unchanged in the 1950s in Sri Lanka. And this was a period of important and protracted post-colonial struggle of workers in Sri Lanka at the time. It appeared also, yeah, with Eric Fromm, Hilda Weiss, who adapted some of Marx's questions for a psychoanalytic survey of workers in Weimar, Germany. So clearly used in such a wide variety of contexts and indeed at some of the most important and significant moments of class struggle in the 20th century. And I think that the reason for this is Marx asked originally uh, 101 questions. This is extensive. And there can be some limitations to considering how long this is and how long it would take someone to fill this out. But I think a lot of those questions are clearly relevant for studying the capitalist workplace at any moment in time. We've obviously had massive technological changes, social changes since Marx composed this. But the fact that all these different groups and all these different international contexts were using his survey, it clearly demonstrates that it still has practical import all these years on uh, after he originally created it. And in terms of the limitations of the survey, which you mentioned as well, clearly there are limitations. One of these is the length of the survey. And there, there are many different groups today who use workers' inquiries and use questionnaires modeled on Marx. Uh, but reduce these questions. For example, Notes from Below have been pursuing a massive class composition project. And the results of the class composition project should hopefully be published later this year. And that, that would be a really interesting publication, by the way. But yeah, this sort of survey is used a lot shorter. And this obviously has more implications. Notes were able to gather hundreds of responses to these surveys. Whereas in, in Marx's original survey, we know that 58 uh, workers in the Netherlands responded to this. So one of the limitations of it is perhaps the length. Uh, and also some of the questions might be seen as obsolete. This is one of the critiques that can be leveled against Marx more broadly, right? That Marx is renting at a period of industrial capitalism, but today in our sort of post Fordist economy, maybe Marx isn't relevant anymore. Maybe the workplace isn't relevant anymore, uh, but I could not argue against this further. I think that Marx is as relevant as ever. There are more workers than ever. There are more hours of labor time objectified as dead labor in capital than there have probably ever been in the history of capitalism. So I think Marx's inquiry is totally relevant today. And that's why all these different groups have been using it for the past 140 years in all these different contexts. And I suppose 
with some of the questions even that we would consider obsolete, Marx talks about uh, steam power and things like this and, and the use of steam engines in factories. Steam engines aren't maybe so extensively utilized yeah. anymore, but really the thrust of that question, the essence of the question is still relevant. It, he's asking about what energy is used, how do we generate power and what are the implications of this for worker organizing and, and for capitalist development more broadly. We can adapt these questions as the original groups who used the inquiry did. And I think it has a, a, an enduring legacy and an enduring relevance uh, today as demonstrated in all, all these different examples. Yeah. So you mentioned specifically like the role of a worker's inquiry in the context of something like contemporary economy. And there are all of these discussions that happen in different fields around things like platform capitalism and the digital economy. I want to ask you about that in a moment, but just before we get onto that, I was wondering, because you've looked through a lot of these original survey responses, and you said that the workers didn't respond to all the questions that were presented to them. When looking through responses to the survey, did you notice any kind of patterns in the sorts of questions that workers felt it was important to answer and which ones they overlooked or wrote off? Sure. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. I think a, a very discernible pattern emerges when reading through all of these responses. Which, by the way, hopefully with notes from below, we'll be able to issue a complete translation of all the worker responses at some point in the future. As I say, for now, we, there's a selected responses of some of those most detailed answers to the survey. Um, and there are hundreds of pages of responses. 58 workers might not sound like a huge sample, but there are, I, th I think, 200 pages in total for these questions. And in terms of the particular issues that workers go into more detail in discussing, we see that questions Marx asked about, for example, health and safety. Uh, he asks about industrial accidents, means for preventing these. He asks about hygiene conditions, about particular diseases, uh, which affect workers both outside and inside the workplace. Uh, and it's really to those kind of questions that workers submit the most detailed and interesting responses. And on one level, this is unsurprising because the 19th century was a period of generally uh, deplorable base working conditions in Europe and elsewhere. Nobody would dispute that. But also considering contemporary forms of work, and indeed the past two years of the coronavirus pandemic, of workers being forced to bear the brunt, not just of the contemporary economic crisis of capital, but also of the existential threat of the virus, workers being exposed to the virus and crammed warehouses and logistics uh, and retail and food processing and manufacturing industries. Workers have, have, are suffering from the same kinds of negligent and largely non-unionized profit-driven labor, which lent those original respondents of Marx's survey to discuss all these problems. So when workers talk and answer Marx's questions and talk about workers falling into vats of boiling hydrochloric acid and sugar factories, workers losing their eyes, their ears, their limbs to machinery and steel plants and then blacksmith orgies uh, and workers generally describing the deterioration of their health uh, and of their mental health as well. Some workers report being driven to the point of insanity by the sheer stress and pressure of overwork and exploitation. These are all contemporary phenomena as well. And I think that they reveal in many ways a fundamental invariance to capitalism an unchanging nature of the social conditions and the social relations behind um, capitalist production. So they're really relevant today. And again, these questions would elicit perhaps different, but not too dissimilar responses by many workers all over the world today. And again, that shows the relevance for these kind of things that Marx is asking, even though they may be from 140 years ago. The solution to all these problems is obvious. Workers need to organize. Workers need to resist exploitation, gain more control over the workplace, and be able to have more power. Again, that's something we see today. We're living through one of the biggest real strikes in recent history in the UK. And we're also seeing in the survey to Marxist responses, and the workers talk about their own experiences of going on strike, of resisting exploitation, and of assessing the various strategies, failures of strikes. And indeed, some very detailed responses were submitted to that question as well. So we definitely see a sort of pattern emerge uh, when workers reflect on, on these, these particular questions. In fact, I'd like to mention one more as well, which uh, it just came to me that the last question which Marx 
asks, or the second last question which he asks, uh, is about the mental, uh, moral, and physical well-being of workers. That was that probably elicited some of the most detailed responses from workers as well. Again, reporting sometimes very funny stories about frustrations about organizing at work, but also bit, very tragic circumstances that workers suffered through at that time and which we also have to deal with and contend with today. Absolutely. What you were saying about these concerns that workers expressed about the conditions in which they were being forced to labor, there's almost an uncanny similarity between the contents of some of these responses and what we constantly hear coming out of places like Amazon warehouses. But it, in that context, I wanted to know also, obviously the original survey was written way back in 1880. Are there any other questions that you think would maybe be slightly more salient for us to post today in response to maybe changes in the organization of labor, the relations of labor and so on? Sure. That's a great question. As I, I think I mentioned previously, within just a few months of the original survey, already different socialist groups were adapting the questionnaire and adding questions for that purpose, for exploring and trying to gain a more accurate knowledge of worker situations in different national contexts. So for example, the journal Rovnosc, which first translated the inquiry into Polish in July, 1880. They made clear their intention to add particular questions about guild relations, which of course had been almost entirely, not entirely, but almost entirely obliterated in the Western world at that time. But in Eastern Europe, guild forms of work still existed. In the Netherlands too, the questionnaire was adapted with some questions edited to more accurately reflect the types of work that were ongoing. For example, in the ports and the different types of work that existed in the Netherlands in the 1880s as well. And in terms of looking at the change, not just in the capitalist organization of work, but also in the composition of the working class, there are definitely questions that we should update uh, and think about when using and uh, pursuing workers' inquiry today. For example, and a, a great example of this are some questionnaires issued by angry workers, a group that we discussed previously. Uh, angry workers have and have used these kind of questionnaires, um, which are not only pursuing questions geared towards work in general, but some questionnaires geared towards specific workplaces. So for example, I think they have a questionnaire used in organizing efforts as well, containing, I think about 155 questions, all about call centers. So again, the ways in which particular things you would ask in that particular sector that would be totally irrelevant in other forms of work is an example of the adaptation of inquiries in that regard. They also have a questionnaire, for example, on domestic labor and I know what have traditionally been seen as unwaged forms of work, what a lot of Marxists call social reproduction. And again, they have a questionnaire specifically towards looking at domestic labor in the house and outside and that sort of more formal sphere that a lot of people associate with traditional forms of work. So in that regard, there are almost infinite variety of questions that we can ask in an update today, especially in our context, our context in the UK, a changing composition of the working class as well. Uh, the crisis of Brexit and COVID have very starkly revealed the reliance of our capitalist economy on migrant workers, mainly from Eastern Europe uh, and also from North Africa and elsewhere. Uh, and so questionnaires that consider the experiences of migration uh, in more detail, although Marx also talks about certain important things like this as well, but questions that consider these dynamics of a changing class composition uh, would be very important uh, and indeed are used increasingly uh, in workers' inquiry today. Awesome. I wanted to touch slightly more on the historical continuities between Marx's original survey and the work that's being done today by like, in groups like angry workers. Obviously, one of the intentions of workers' inquiry as both the sociological and a political methodology isn't only to produce information about the workplaces. It's also to get workers to reflect themselves on what their workplaces are, to build these kind of connections of solidarity and class consciousness. But one of the things we constantly see in actual attempts to practice workers' inquiry from Marx, again, all the way to the present with the angry workers is a kind of disillusionment about the possibilities for change. In Angry Workers' book, Class Power on Zero Hours, one of the things they constantly emphasize is that a lot of the conversations they 
had with workers at the back of work facility, workers felt really disempowered. And because of this, weren't all that interested in engaging in things like militant organizing, especially when the payoff seems oftentimes to be rather undesirable. A lot of people have their jobs being threatened by engaging in like militant practices. Yeah, that's a very important concern. And I think probably the most important aspect of pursuing workers' inquiry is um, to bear those things in mind and to, to do so appropriately. With regards to this sort of pervasive sense of disillusionment and of, uh, of disempowerment, you're totally correct. I wouldn't argue with that at all. What I would say is that in, in the original responses to Marx's survey and the spread of the survey, we have very similar reflections uh, by workers in the later 19th century. And this was a time following the collapse of the first international working men's association of the brutal suppression of the Paris Commune uh, and of the introduction of new forms of machinery and technology, which threw a lot of workers out of work in the later 19th century. And so you also see this sort of despair, pervasive despair about the possibilities of organizing and resisting exploitation. But at the same time, it's important to note that whilst we see these sort of recurring problems discussed, and it's important to assess this with sober senses, at the same time, only a few decades after this, in all these contexts, in both the Netherlands and Poland uh, and in Russia, very significantly, we have the growth of some of the most powerful trade unions uh, and revolutionary workers' organizations that the world has ever seen. I'm not saying that these things are simple and it will happen naturally, as some people would assume. Uh, we need to organize, workers need to organize for this to happen in order to build workers' power. But whether it be conditions of disillusionment and disempowerment or in conditions where workers are actually on the up and have a lot of power and control, in both contexts, a workers' inquiry is still important and we should still be reflecting on the workplace. And I see a lot of this today, this sort of contemporary disillusionment with work and the possibilities for worker organizing uh, reflected in a, a lot of young leftists who, for example, are perhaps solely focused on the parliamentary struggle on electing a bourgeois labor party or are devoting their attention to other forms of activism in the streets. And of course, all of these different forms of activism are equally valid in their own right, perhaps. But the workplace is still an important site of social struggle. It's the place where human life is materially reproduced. It's the place where we spend most of our lives. So to give up on it is not only absurd, but it's impossible. If we have any hope <laughs> for saving our planet and having workers' power, then we need to organize in the workplace. And I think angry workers, in spite of that recognition of this disillusionment, I believe they end one of their chapters, which is a quite depressing chapter about basically hitting their head against the wall, getting nowhere with any kind of organizing. But angry workers still state, that's a class struggle. We'll keep going. We'll keep going with this because that's all we can do. Yeah. There's something else I wanted to ask you about, specifically in the context of your book that really stood out to me. And I thought it was extremely interesting. From knowing you personally for many years, I know that you have this big interest in especially the experiments in Italian Marxism with like operaismo and autonomism. But one of the main historical resources that you appeal to in this book is, of course, Lenin's workers' inquiry. Uh, this is surprising because the way that many leftists, myself included, appeal to the experiments in socialist communist organizing in Italy in the 20th century is as a response to the perceived failures of, of the Soviet experiment of Soviet communism. Could you possibly comment on uh, maybe disparities or similarities between Lenin's early workers' inquiry and the forms of workers' inquiry used by the autonomous and the operaists, in large part, of course, in reaction to Soviet communism. Sure. So Lenin composed a, a particular questionnaire in 1894 uh, and 1895, uh, and this was used to organize with workers uh, in St. Petersburg at that time. The group that he was organizing with, and of which he was a key member, was called the League of Struggle for the Emancipation of the Working Class. And a lot of early socialists, what we would now call Marxists uh, in Russia at that time, had jobs as teachers and educators in workers' schools, workers' institutes, which were controlled by the bosses, controlled by capitalists. But nonetheless, a lot of socialists were able to infiltrate this 
sort of get more rooted with workers and become more acquainted with working conditions and invited a lot of workers to join their sort of clandestine underground organization. Of course, all of this was profoundly illegal in Russia at this time that organizing a work was a crime. And that's why a lot of the inquiries that, that I talk about in the book, although based in Russia and Poland, a lot of these were published in Switzerland because worker organizers were either deported from the country if they weren't forced to suffer a much worse fate, or they fled from Russian partition Poland uh, to, to areas of more political freedom. So this was all profoundly illegal. And yeah, Lenin used the questionnaire with that group. And there's actually some evidence that the League of Struggle were influenced by a Polish group called Proletariat, which had a lot of links to these journals and newspapers, which published a Marxist workers' inquiry. But it is a different questionnaire, which he uses. And it's not only a questionnaire that they used as well when organizing a, a, a work and gathering data and other information about workers' situations. In her biography of Lenin, uh, Nadia Krupskaya writes about how Lenin was obsessed with other forms of data gathering, of interviewing with workers. And it's generally been assumed that Lenin only interviewed one worker once and he found the experience uh, tedious and he never showed it again. But in fact, that's true, by the way. But, but <laughs> the is, yeah, he, he did. He, he was really interested in other interviews with workers that other militants did, his other comrades did. And I think Kripskaya actually reports um, going undercover into workers' barracks um, and interviewing workers and, and distributing socialist pamphlets, some uh, including the questionnaire. And some of the other militants of the League of Struggle reported that Lenin was always asking for this to be distributed and circulated. And this is a, it's a really important context in which this emerges um, because this is the period in the mid-1890s which Lenin would later advance uh, partially uh, for the economism of the Russian socialist movement of this sort of overfixation with, with workers and working conditions and economic demands instead of more political demands, for example, the political freedom that workers also wanted in Russia at the time. And while he was later critical of some of this, it, it's important to recognize that early Economism, we might call it, we're getting rooted with workers, focusing on workers' demands and workers' interests alone. This was also pivotal for the development of the later Russian Social Democratic Labour Party and of the Bolsheviks. The Bolsheviks were successful because they were, for a long time, a mass working class party, and their most ardent supporters and members were steel workers, and mainly in Petrograd and St. Petersburg. So the early attempts to do this, to get rooted with workers, emerged through that group, the League of Struggle. And the method through which they did this was the distribution of not only a questionnaire, but also other forms of undercover research and interviews with workers, which in many ways prefigures a lot of the later developments of workers' inquiry that we see in America, for example, by the Johnston Forest tenancy, who also used uh, interviews and other methods of worker writing and, and things like this. But yeah, it's a very interesting context that a sort of Russian, early Russian effort. It was a time as well where the workers who were involved in the League of Struggle were mainly seen as sort of members of the socialist intelligentsia. And this move towards uh, mass questionnaires was an attempt by Lenin and, and, and others to, to get rooted amongst the working class as a whole and not just what I believe Plekhanov referred to as the most advanced section of the working class. So there is a way of reading this that also prefigures uh, the operaistic struggles in the 60s and 70s in Italy, which you mentioned, of getting rooted with the workers as a whole and not just focusing on um, those workers who might want to discuss socialist politics, but all workers. And that's something that the worker has really emphasized over half a century later. Uh, but of course, it is interesting because there is this association of Lenin and Leninism, or rather Marxism-Leninism, as the form of organization through which operaismo and autonomism was a, almost an escape from and a critique from. So there, there are a lot of tensions there that can be explored, but it's a very interesting context, Lenin's questionnaire. It's something that I'd love to do if I had the time. Maybe I will have the time at some point <laughs> to do more research, Sean, and actually see like how this questionnaire circulated in, in more detail. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that when the workers' inquiry was first practiced in countries like Russia and Poland, the activities surrounding it were strictly illegal. Despite this, one of the Polish organizations involved in 
printing and distributing the workers' inquiry describes, uh, where they say the factory is a big open book. You only have to read it. And you make a, a really interesting comment on this observation in your introduction. You say, such a reading today necessitates an understanding that the factory is not always an open book, but a distorted economic battlefield. What is it about like the organization of labor today and maybe the changes between the Polish inquiry and contemporary inquiries that has changed it from being totally imminent and obvious to workers to being, as you put it, a distorted economic battlefield. So one of the main tensions in thinking about that Ehrlich statement that the Polish organizers who use workers inquiry make, um, and this is a very important statement. The factory is an open book. There's the political significance to this. As Mark said, the factory is a closed forbidden abode. There's hidden space, no entry except on official business. And so they're making a very important political intervention here by encouraging workers and workers necessarily did not need this encouragement. Workers were already doing this, but to, to critically exploring the workplace and thinking about it in a political sense and contesting the exploitation, which is presented as normal at the time and indeed as always with capitalism. But it's also important to, to contextualize this with later developments in the capitalist organization of work. Because as I try and argue in that particular part of the book, whilst the factory can be a wide open book that we can study and that we should study and we should organize in, uh, the workplace is also distorted by capitalist managerial techniques, which aim to distort workers' knowledge. Previously, and especially at this time, the massive knowledge attributed to the working class, unsurprisingly by Marx and these other socialists, this knowledge of production, which workers had, and sometimes managers and the owners of factories and the employer class actually didn't have, that's changed somewhat. There is this phenomena we're all aware of, of Taylorism. Frederick Taylor, an American factory foreman and industrial engineer, a worker himself, uh, he conducted widespread uh, studies. He did his own inquiries. We could call them capitalist inquiries, but by a worker. And he wrote a very famous book uh, called The Principles of Scientific Management. Uh, and his idea of scientific management uh, was an attempt to distort workers' knowledge and uh, stop workers' power in the workplace. Uh, and it's this sort of idea of Taylorism as the maximum efficiency possible uh, for valorizing capital. Um, in order to get this, we must break up the workshop. We must break up workers' knowledge um, and workers should be in many ways subsumed by machinery and workers reduced to operators of machinery rather than using tools of their own as a convenient way, perhaps, of slowing down workers' ability to control and have autonomy over what they're producing. And this sort of Taylorist efforts in many ways led to the conjuncture of Fordism the standard capitalist productive paradigm of the 20th century, the creation of the assembly line, when machinery does the work and workers are operating these machines and the pace of production is controlled by managers and technicians and specialists and not the operators on the shop floor themselves. But of course, again, workers' inquiry can reveal the ways in which, in spite of this, these attempts to distort the workplace and control, workers can still have a massive and potentially even more disruptive power when acting together and can create a lot of trouble in the workplace by shutting down these assembly lines and causing a lot of chaos. So there's always ways in which workers can regain that autonomy and that control in the workplace. But it is an important point to make that there are these strategies for controlling and distorting workers' knowledge. Today, one of, the, one of the most common ways of doing this, uh, you find this in any mass warehouse uh, in the logistics sphere, any warehouse today in, in the Western world, uh, workers are, don't have knowledge imminently, as you said, about where they're going and what they're doing, uh, because this is controlled via an algorithm uh, set by managers, which tells you where to go in the warehouse, what to pick, where to take it. And by being interpolated individually in this way, Workers can be very easily divided and can, and, and the knowledge is bonded in, in the machinery and in, in the managerial tactics used rather than in workers autonomously deciding what's the best way of shipping these orders and, and performing their work. Um, but as always, there, there's ways for workers to organize in this regard too. But I think it's important to highlight that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You touched upon something else there 
that I think is really important for understanding workers' inquiry today and which we need to bear in mind as Marxists, which is we often talk about, for example, the split between operaismo and post-operaismo or workerism and post-workerism. And discussions of this usually happen in the context of the work of Antonio Negri. It, what he considers to be his key contribution to uh, the study of the workplace is what he describes as the transition from the mass worker to the social worker. And it maps exactly onto this split that you've described in the organization of labor, where the production of value out of labor power becomes socially diffuse. It's no longer just concentrated in the factory. So I was wondering if you could possibly, or if I could trouble you for your thoughts on all of this work that's happening now around post operaismo and platform capitalism and digital economies. Sure. On the one hand, the massive amount of research and uh, very good, very critical Marxist research that's being conducted into all these areas, into digital economies, into platform capitalism more broadly, this testifies to the importance of Marxist research, some of the best material and all of these things are produced by uh, Marxist writers, Marxist uh, militants, and um, this critical appraisal of these new forms of the development of capitalist production. This tension that exists between the earlier figure of the mass worker, the hero of operismo, and new forms of, as you say, that the, the Negri has helped to develop ideas of the social worker or the multitudes and all these different ways of looking at the transformation of public power and capitalist society since those industrial struggles of the 60s and 70s. These are really important to consider. The mass worker, as construed at that time, in many ways does not exist because that type of industrial worker in Italy lived during a paradigm of Keynesianism, of state control and pre-neoliberal capitalism. And so there are important distinctions to make from the mass industrial worker of that time and the situations of the contemporary class composition of workers today, which post operismo has tried to do. But I think there is a, there's also a, a political significance to contesting some of the post operisti developments and theories. The word itself, post workerist, does it not reveal an abandonment of the working class and of the workers? as the subjects of capitalism. As Mario Tronti said, all capitalist innovation and capitalist dynamism is forced on capital as a reaction to working class struggles, to the movements of the working classes. And I think that the original theses of Italian workerism, while certainly much has changed, remain fundamentally uh, correct. We can, there's been attempts to recenter the mass worker today some articles and notes from below, for example, looking at Amazon and other mass industries as the new fiat today and a new mass worker emerging with important differences, obviously considered. And I think, I suppose fundamentally, whilst there is a lot of very interesting research that we would classify as post-workerist, and as you say as well into things like digital economies, this is very important. But we also see emerging ideas about effective and you know, audience labor, things where we are performing work and valorizing capital when we're using social media or watching videos on YouTube and things like this. And that this can be empirically proved by certain post operaist thinkers to be a form of work and a form of labor. And I don't wish to contest all of that because there's an importance to considering this. But there's a sort of move away from the workplace for this, right? There's a difference between looking on your phone, which you can turn off at any time or do something else, and being under the thumb of the bosses in the factory, which you also need to do in order to live and <laughs> get your wage. So I think there's an importance to also contesting a lot of the moves away from the working class as a whole. But uh, yeah, a lot of very interesting uh, Marxist research has been conducted in this way. I could probably talk for hours about this. I hope I'm not going <laughs> to off kilter. <laughs> Just as a, actually a follow-up question to that, um, something I've noticed among a lot of post uh, maybe like uh, Franco Bifo Berardi, is that there's this kind of pervasive pessimism among a lot of them, perhaps coextensive with what you earlier described as the abandonment of the worker. I was wondering if uh, you have any thoughts on what it is about the specific phenomenon of post and the approach that people associated with that label take, which leads them to this kind of pessimism and despondency about the possibility of revolutionary change in society. 
So in the 60s and 70s, workers had a massive amount of power in Italy. I'll talk just about Italy, of course, seeing as we're using so many Italian <laughs> terms and Italian <laughs> thinkers. There's an importance to this. Obviously, the world can't be reduced to Italy alone, but Italy was a veritable moment, a veritable thunderclap of working class power and social revolt, which occurred there in the 60s and 70s. I would argue, as many others would, comparable to 1917 and its significance. And it maybe has not recently we're seeing a lot more translated into English and in other languages, allowing people to grasp more about what actually happened in Italy at that time. But it was a massive moment for the working class internationally, I would argue. And that the sort of devastating crushing of workers' power in Italy, which began in, in 1979, but which, which was obviously prefigured by many other things as well. This has understandably led to a period of depression and political despair amongst a lot of working class militants and then amongst a lot of socialists and Marxists as well. In the same way, perhaps we can compare with Marx's own very severe depression, which he fell into after the collapse and the defeat of the Paris Commune. And so reflecting on the new forms of work, I wouldn't argue it's a, it, that it's some sort of escape from or an excuse for not looking at working class struggle. It's very important. But there, there has been a, new, a changed class composition, the defeat of one of the most powerful trade union movements in the world in the UK as well, and from the industrial struggles of automobile workers in Britain and the minor strike in the 1980s, and, and the crushing of worker organization of the trade unions in Britain, understandably led to massive despair and an accurate appraisal that the working class situation today is not what it was in a former period of power and leverage. But having said that, the working class is still here. The working class is bigger than ever. There may be different forms of work uh, and they receive in this post operaste current and tendency a massive amount of attention, digital labor and, and other things. And this is all very important. But there are also still traditional forms of work which are vital. Food manufacturing, food processing. You know, there are massive factories in Western Europe in which all this labor is performed, often by highly exploited migrant workers from Eastern Europe uh, and elsewhere. And there are massive industries, logistics, uh, uh, retail, where workers are uh, unorganized, or if there is organization, it's invisible. As again, we may use an old operistic concept, an invisible organization, which a lot of Marxist militants maybe don't understand or, or we're trying to understand the beginning to grasp and um, by using workers inquiry. And I think I mentioned before, there's more objectified hours of labor time, of dead labor, that's being subsumed by capital today than there probably has ever been. There are more workers who exist probably at any point in human history, at least in the history of capitalism, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> there are more types of work, more uh, varieties of work. Um, and indeed, most people in the modern world are working class. In Marxist time, the proletariat was not, did not encompass the majority of humanity. Agricultural workers, peasants and farmers did. Today, we're living in an era where most work has been fundamentally transformed and proletarianized. So I think that a resurgence of operismo in this new context is what is necessary for Marxist research and socialist politics, rather than an abandonment of the mass worker. You know, I think that we can use not only research all these new forms of work, these digital economies and whatnot, but we can also carry the spirit of Marx and the spirit of workerism into examining the youth class composition of workers which exist today. The working class hasn't disappeared. Yeah. Bigger than ever. Now, you mentioned this proliferation, not only of the working class itself, but also of kinds of work and maybe the creation of different kinds of industries. If, if I'm not mistaken, the financial industry in Marx's time, for example, was relatively small. I was wondering, if there are any industries that you think are especially important today, at least in your economic analysis, to, to organize in, to, to conduct workers' inquiry in? Sure. But there are so many forms of work, types of work, in particular industries that we hear about, which are vital to organize in. And this is a sort of important thrust to a lot of contemporary uh, material that's being written on labor organizing and trade union organizing more, wide, more widely with the appearance of the new Amazon workers union in America and various other labor strategies in those sort of mass industries like logistics, like transport, 
and then manufacturing fundamentally as well. And we also have seen recently, I can't remember when this was now, was it last year? That shipping container that got, it got stuck in the Suez Canal. <laughs> There's all these proliferations of different theories of, if this one ship can halt global capitalism so monumentally, all we need to do is organize in a couple of particular places that we, capitalism can end, it can collapse if workers were to strategically organize in particular industries and shut down production in this way or take over production in this way. And if that happens, I'm not going to argue against it, but I don't think so. I think that we need to organize everywhere and anywhere. Victory for workers in any industry and in any sector even sectors which may become obsolete in the coming decades with increasing automation and other forms of technology and strategies for this contradictory strategy of capital trying to shed its dependency on the commodity labor power. But of course, labor power is the only commodity capable within the social relations of productions of capitalism of creating that surplus value, that profit that capital uh, is created from. But nonetheless, I think even in all of these industries, I think a victory for workers anywhere uh, is necessary and the workers' inquiry should be conducted anywhere. And also, those who conduct workers' inquiry, who is it for? It's not just for socialist militants to carry into to the workplace to investigate. It's for workers to use. And most people, I mean, we have a, a degree of choice into where we can go to work, but we can go to work anywhere we want. In any place where an individual finds themselves having to have a job, a workers' inquiry is relevant in. Sure. That's how you do a sound sailing <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. We've mentioned a couple times now the figure of Mario Tronti. I know he's a very important figure to the kind of work that you do and your particular research. I was wondering if you could give maybe like a short overview of his character and maybe some of his key ideas for our listeners. So Tronti is a monumental figure in the history of operaismo and is increasingly being appreciated in the Anglosphere with some recent publications, for example, his sort of main study, Workers in Capital, which is actually a series of, of different articles and different essays, which he wrote for the journal Caderne Rossi in Italy uh, in the 1960s. That was translated a few years ago by David Brodard and published by Verso. And also another fantastic text, which appeared, I think just about a year and a half ago, The Weapon of Organization, which is a series of previously untranslated letters and other political writings of Tronti that was published and translated by Andrew Anastasi from Viewpoint Magazine, another fantastic text, which is allowing a Marxist to, to grasp Tronti today. And yeah, in terms of giving a sort of overview of his ideas, Tronti wrote for Caderni Rossi uh, originally, uh, the sort of original workerist uh, journal uh, in Italy. Um, and in that journal uh, also appeared workers' inquiries conducted by Romano Alclati, another important uh, workerist figure. Mm -hmm. And this group, Cuderni Rossi, and later another group, Classi Operaia, which Tronti was a, a central uh, figure within. The real thrust of their ideas and of Tronti's ideas in particular was to orient socialist politics towards the working class. Tronti argued that all capitalist innovation and development proceeds from workers' struggles, from the movements of the working class. And it was in his introduction to the workers' inquiry where Marx stated that the fundamental purpose of the inquiry is to grasp the movements, the conditions within which the working class lives and moves. Tronti developed these ideas from Marx. Marx talks about, for example, the use of machinery as an important part of capitalist development as rooted in worker struggles against the length of the working day. Even the creation of the capitalist class was a response to workers' organizing. Before workers organized and voiced and voiced their collective demands, exercised that political logos. Before that, capitalists were necessarily in competition with one another. Their interests as individual entrepreneurs did not lend itself easily to cooperation as workers' interests historically have done. So it was through the unity of the working class that sort of forces on capital to, to form a, as a class, as a bourgeois class against workers' collective interests. And so workers have all, always thrown up the most important moments of capitalism's own development. And that's really one of the fundamental theses of Tronti. Some people call this the Copernican revolution in, in Marxist thought in the 20th century. Tronti also argues for 
a rigorous perspectivism, almost Nietzschean in its development, that workers, what he calls the working class science, workers should pursue their own interests independent of reliance on bourgeois norms and values and ideas, and that workers can trust in their own strength and power. And indeed, in this period in which Trotsky was writing these ideas, which you can read in more detail in his in Workers and Capital, this magnificent text, this was a time where the mainstream workers' movement in Italy, the PCI, the Communist Party of Italy, the, uh, the trade union movement, the main trade union federations, they ignored worker struggle. Most of the worker, the traditional leaders, if you will, of the working class uh, wrote off worker struggle. And this was a time where Italy was witnessing a massive social transformation. Uh, many hundreds of thousands uh, of largely young uh, migrant workers from the south of Italy were migrating in, into the industrial north of the country. And the trade unions and the workers' movement and the communist and socialist parties had really failed to organize with these workers and had denounced them, for example, during the Piazza Statuto riot in Turin and denounced their strategies of resistance. These workers may not have joined the official organs of workers' power, but they were organizing in the workplace through passivity, through uh, arriving late to the workplace, through their own forms of a rejection of capitalist work. And it was fundamentally, it was Tronte uh, and the other militants of Fni Rossi who recognized this social force as this is what socialist politics should be oriented towards, the working class, and understand this new class composition. And fundamentally for Tronte, that, that socialist politics in that period, um, and I think this is why it's relevant today, should focus on examining the class composition of workers and of capital and a living socialist struggle to proceed with this sort of prioritizing of worker struggle itself. There's an anecdote from, I'm not sure if the PCI had this exact, had this same sort of system, but Henri Simon from France, he talks about this, the French Communist Party in this period as well, that they would only represent workers in industrial tribunals and their trade unions would only accept workers as members if they had a proven track record of being a good worker by their own boss. So this valorization of the worker as a noble and, and obedient subject is something that workers in Italy totally discarded. And one of the best ways of seeing this is, and not just in Tronti's ideas, but in some of the illustrations and the cartoons that appear in, in Classe Operaia and the other newspapers that he was a part of, the sort of affirmation of the, what Tronti called the crude pagan race of the working class and not the, the noble knights of labor there to obey the bosses and save the world. And there's a sort of a brief introduction, I suppose, to Trump's ideas. <laughs> cool. I think we're uh, just out of time and I'm worried if we carry on any longer, we'll not be accused of class reductionism, but of Italian reductionism. So I wanted to actually just read out one paragraph from your introduction to the workers increase, which I thought was really exceptional. And then maybe to ask for some closing comments from you. So okay. you, this paragraph occurs in the context of another attempt at workers inquiry by a, a Mr. Domela Noyanhui, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. And his approach to it was very much a sort of inquiry from above, trying to use workers' inquiry not to help workers self-organize, but to impose a kind of organizational apparatus from above. So sure. you write this, where Marx is unequivocal over working class autonomy, here instead, it appears that the inquiry is not to be led by workers, but by professional bureaucrats. Construing the worker as an external subject, there to aid the researcher who, while supportive of workers' struggle, directs the inquiry from above, upholds the distinction between intellectual and manual labor. More than this, it can lead sympathetic militants to erroneous conclusions. For example, following the institutions that claim to represent workers, rather than engaging with the class itself. Workers' inquiry is also primarily a political tool used to supplement the organization of proletarian power in the class struggle. Is there anything that you want to leave our listeners with before we finish off? I think, I think you've said it yourself. <laughs> Let's leave it there. <laughs> I would maybe one thing I would, these, uh, bureaucracies that are mentioned, it, I think it's important to note as well, different forms of organization of workers, including trade unions are not necessarily sutured and inevitably prone to bureaucratization. As Marx argues in an important address to the First International, 
which I also reproduce in this book, that trade unions can become vehicles, not only for the strengthening of workers in wage labor, but for the abolition of wage labor. So we can see how different forms of worker organization, uh, including trade unions, have a very important role um, as vehicles for workers' power in the class struggle. But indeed, we bureaucrats can use this as well. Even a worker's inquiry can be used uh, by different groups. And I think the fundamental point, which you mentioned yourself there perfectly, is this neutrality that we have to contest. Workers' inquiry is always political. Uh, it's never neutral uh, and that it intervenes on the side of workers in the class struggle. All right. Thank you so much, Clark. Everyone, be sure to read this book whenever you can, published by Notes from Below. What else is there to say? As the angry workers like to say, let's get rooted. Or as they used to say in Italy, vogliamo tutto. Thank you, everyone. Vogliamo tutto. Thank you so much, Kenny. Thank you. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.